Patrick Daniel with Patrick Daniel Law and Randy Canchi uh, back on the legal lens. We are blessed today to have Joey Gonzalez, the CEO of Berries. Anybody who doesn't know Berries, I would be surprised because Joey's got a trillion followers. So uh, it's the original cardio and strength interval workout. So Joey, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, to put it mildly, you guys have a pretty amazing company. Um, I noticed when I was reading about things, your expansion, unlike any other fitness platform that I've ever seen, is international, um, which is relatively unheard of in my opinion. Um, tell me a little bit about the decision and your involvement in taking it kind of global, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, so Barry's from the very beginning, we were founded in 1998. So uh, there is a man named Barry who came before me uh, and he was, you know, I call him the, the mad scientist, uh, total frontier, uh, and came up with this idea of, you know, putting treadmills and weights in a room and hosting this, you know, class that would be the ultimate fat burning sort of lean muscle tissue building experience. Um, and from that, Barry's was born. Uh, and the way that we grew from that day forward was just very organically. Uh, including the way I stumbled upon Berries, which was first as a client uh, and fell in love with it in around 2003, mm -hmm. which is how I began my career and how I started to like move around different parts of the U.S. and invest in open studios. Um, it's the same way that we found our first partners who were actually in Norway. Uh, they just became obsessed with the product and the experience and the brand uh, and asked, you know, what would it take for us to open a Berries in Norway? And so lo and behold, like we became an international company. I think that was in 2011. Um, and so we've had the same experience in different parts of the world. We have really great UK partners who were first clients. And in fact, one of them started as an instructor in West Hollywood. Um, so just through this, you know, organic sort of growth, we've been able to cultivate a really special community uh, of people that feel like they're part of something much bigger than a business. Well, that's one of the things that I found to be extremely interesting about the company itself is that you've cultivated almost a feeling, if you will, with respect to your studios. The one thing that you've managed to maintain across the board, despite having so many locations, is consistency and stability. How have you done it? Uh, for a while, it was just a lot of work, a small group of us being in many different places at once. And then once we uh, took our first investment from North Castle Partners in 2015 and sort of revved up the growth engine, we realized uh, we had to invest uh, in our mission, vision, and values, which was identifying what it was that made Berries, you know, so special. Um, and they, they had always existed. We just hadn't really articulated them for people. Uh, people just learned what they were from working with, with us and with one another. Um, and so giving birth to that system, I think, is what really helped us um, open a lot of studios you know, at a much more rapid pace while maintaining that culture. You know, I would have to think that mission statements, those sorts of things, you know, sometimes they're relatively unheard of, but the one thing I've learned because my wife is a big believer in them and she's our strategy officer is that they're so important for maintaining the direction of the company, particularly if you're going to grow and you guys are growing like wildfire. What about the values associated with the company and the mission statement? Do you do on a daily basis to remind yourself of how to maintain that focus in that direction? Because I think it's really amazing that you've managed to grow this thing so fast under your leadership. Yeah. Well, so personally, I mean, what I do, and, and we've, we've actually given um, our mission, vision, and values to people, not only through email, but also like on notepads. And so they live everywhere in our office um, and people's backpacks. And they serve two main purposes, I think, first. Um, the values provide really like a code of conduct 
and help explain to employees, including myself, like what's expected of me, right? Like how am I supposed to treat people? Why am I here? Um, and then secondly, uh, they really help in daily decision making. And so if there are other, if there are ever business decisions, both small or big that I am kind of on the fence about, I look to, you know, that system, to the mission, the vision values to, to really understand um, what would serve Barry's the organization best. So directionally, your focus is always on, this is what our mission is. These are what our values are. And we always act accordingly. That's right. And typically, I think once you know them, um, you, your behavior becomes really intuitive. You know, like you just know, you know, I work at Barry's, so I'm expected to obviously work hard, but have fun and treat people like family. And you just, you start to like understand it. And in some cases, like if the values don't resonate with people, um, they don't last or they choose to leave. And that's like, that's okay too, you know, because you should find an organization or a place that you feel like you belong and that you share those values with. You know, in a position of leadership and to be successful on some level, most people have to be pretty type A. And the mantra of family and community and being communal with your staff is not always consistent with that. In fact, it's what I struggle with probably more than anything being a lawyer. You know, we're kind of born to argue and be contentious with people, particularly if you're type A. How have you managed to balance those two? Because I know balance is something you've discussed uh, throughout your life. I can't balance very well myself. So how have you managed to maintain the consistency between being a communal leader, but also being the aggressive type A leader that is able to promote growth of a company like yours? Um, I think they can definitely coexist. I think one of the advantages of you know, being in this position at Barry's is that even though, you know, we attract a client and a person who typically is type A, right? They want um, the most intense amount of exercise they can get in the shortest amount of time. Um, and, you know, they want results um, and they want, I think, you know, my, my suspicion is more than anything, what they, what they also want is love. Um, and that's why people come to Barry's for the workout, but they keep coming back because of the connections uh, and because of the relationships. Um, and so that's how I've found that balance, right? And how I approach my day to day is like, I have so much I need to get done. I have to stay on track. I'm by nature very type A. I have done things like started to meditate. I no longer drink coffee, like, cause that kind of takes the edge off for me. Um, but when it's all based in this idea of like, you know, what you're trying to ultimately de deliver to people is love and a sense of belonging. I think it kind of balances it, itself out. I'm going to ask another question before I turn it over to Randy. I'm being greedy. Sorry. Um, I'm curious, what have you employed, you think, in your personal life that is carried over to make you a better leader? Because meditation is something I keep hearing being preached to me that I have not employed consistently. What in your life has been a profound influence? Um, oh gosh, there have been so many. If I had to narrow it down, I'd say first and foremost, I think growing up the way that I did, um, experiencing a tremendous amount of hardship and struggle just made me a much more empathic leader. Because when you struggle a lot uh, and when you feel, um, you know, when you go through those emotions and those feelings in the first, you know, 15 to 18 years of your life, you are committed to trying to make sure nobody else does, right? So I think that's helped a lot as a leader. Um, and in terms of like a daily practice for me, meditation is absolutely, you know, I think the most important thing um, especially for people who are experiencing a lot of stress uh, because all of most of the negative things that happen around us in the world um, come from fear. Uh, and one of the only ways to alleviate fear in our own lives and in our minds is through meditation, is through understanding what's happening at a thought world level 
um, and understanding, because that's actually what makes us unique. And we develop our subconscious at a very young age. And it's all thanks to mom and dad and anyone, anyone else who was around us. Um, and having that like daily calming of the mind and really understanding like who we are and what our thoughts are and the fact that we can't control them, but we can at least understand them. Um, that will, that has given me, you know, a much clearer head, uh, which has helped me, you know, stay grounded and make difficult decisions and move forward, you know, in difficult times, especially nowadays. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Randy, you want to, I'll turn it over to you for a little bit. Sure, I'll have some questions. So, during, uh, Patrick and Nicolette back in April said, you know, we're, they came in the door and they closed the door behind them. It was this very quiet sort of conversation. It's like, we're thinking about for the month of June doing this Pride Month, are you okay with that? I said, of course I'm okay with it. And so we want to bring on, uh, you know, CEOs, leaders, business executive authors that are gay, that are, that are members of the community. And so I thought of you. And um, in our conversations that we've had, about life and, and you sort of peppered on some of this stuff being an empath and sort of uh, empathically discharging talk about these concepts of fear and pain and um have those experiences that you've had growing up and feeling maybe marginalized or, or feeling pain or feeling maybe that you, you weren't enough has that shaped who you are as a dad and as a ceo Oh yeah, definitely both. Yeah. Tell us. Um, so, I mean, as a CEO, um, it's, it helps prioritize, I think from a culture standpoint, it helps set up, you know, systems to make sure um, that your employees feel not just accepted, but celebrated. Um, and that, you know, this, that, by the way, is like still a learning process for me because you can always be better and you can always, you know, be bigger. And, and we're definitely from a resource perspective committed to that at Barry's. Um, from a parenting standpoint, I have drilled it in my children's heads that the most important thing is to be nice to people. Um, and obviously like they always work hard at whatever they do, you know, if it's school or my son's a little like too young for that, but um, there's definitely like discipline in our home. Um, and I think one interesting like story that sort of embodies the crossover between my work life and my home life is that uh, I found a painting at a garage sale probably like eight years ago. And it said, work hard and be nice to people. Um, and that's really my mantra. Uh, it always has been. And we at Barry's like one day did a social media post where after the work we put out in parentheses. So it's like work out hard and be nice to people. And it just, be, it went viral and it became this thing that like everybody started to repost. And so now it lives in a lot of different studios, marketing moments in different studios and collateral and on our retail. Um, and so, yeah. I think that's that's definitely like impacted me and is is basically you know making sure i really believe that like when all is said and done no matter what religion you are no matter what your belief system is no matter how spiritual or not you are um the one thing that everyone can acknowledge is all we have is each other you know that's it and um the value of the, the way that I value myself is really around how I make people feel. Um, and I want my children to feel that same way, you know, cause I think that's the way that the world becomes better. It's been a tough year. <clears throat> what have, what resources have you called on or what have you done yourself to think, how, how am I going to get through this? I mean, what's gotten you through this year? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, thank goodness I have an incredible executive team. Um, I have a very, very special relationship with my private equity company. They are, um, they've been so supportive at every turn. Um, they've helped, allowed me, you know, to make decisions to continue to so support employees. 
um, while having essentially like zero dollars of revenue coming in. Um, and I think it's just been, um, you know, from my, not only my executive team to my, uh, to the North Castle partners, but also like the friends and family that I surround myself with. Um, that's what's really fueled my tank. And that's what, what has given me, you know, the strength to go through day after day uh, and make, you know, really difficult decisions and talk about, you know, fear. Um, I've never experienced more fear than in the past three months, you know, like many other people. Um, so getting through all of that, it's just, it's been my support system. Yeah. One thing that we've, we've interviewed a bunch of people this month and all of my straight friends that maybe were, were tuning in and listening said, well, it sounds like being gay is both terrifying and a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, in a way it, it is. Um, and so because we sort of have with these difficult waters that we have to navigate through. But there's also, I think, hopefully the sense that when you do do that, there's this place of, of authenticity and truth and, and strength, right? That you gain from it. Um, but so my question to you is, what's been the best thing about being gay and what's been the toughest thing? Uh, so the, I think the toughest thing is having been born and raised in a place where um, it was just incredibly homogenous, you know, very like the suburbs of the Midwest. Um, nobody was gay, nobody was anything, you know, except <laughs> it just, it was, yeah, it was, it was a tough place to grow up and be, you know, Latin, much less gay. Uh, and so that just, that was, really a struggle because for a long time I was ridiculed and made fun of and you know just went through a lot of hardship for a long time um and I think that in the end the irony is that like that's been the best part about being gay is like um going from a life that you hate um, and where you have no joy almost to um, a life, you know, 20 years later that you couldn't be more proud of and that you just wake up every morning in gratitude. Um, you know, I just feel like it's been um, so amazing to live through that arc, you know, to have a lifetime and be able to like come through that adversity and and see the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and to have access to things, you know, as a, as, as a gay child growing up that I never thought I would. Like, I didn't think I'd be able to get married, you know. Um, I grew up during a time where being gay meant you most likely were going to die of AIDS. You know, it was the 80s and it was a very scary time. And um, I never imagined being married. I never thought I could have children. And so, um, yeah, I think the best and the worst are all sort of wrapped up in one. And it's this crazy thing called life, you know, and how we react to it. For sure. Do you think that if you weren't in that place, those those sort of dark periods, right, the struggle, that you wouldn't have been as successful? You wouldn't have been as hungry? Um, I think adversity fuels greatness. And so I don't know where I would be or what I would have done, but I do really believe that, you know, the things that challenge us change us. Um, and I, I think that it's up to the person which direction they change us. So Barry, Patrick, I want to ask Patrick, you. Patrick, Patrick, I've been hogging him. Go ahead. Go for it. No, no. You know, Jerry, the one thing that I, I have consistently heard from a number of our guests is there was a period of darkness, a period that seemed bleak. And I've asked everybody to a certain extent, you know, who you are has been forged from that adversity on some level. What got you through it? You know, when you had such a bleak outlook without happiness, without hope, because I can't even imagine, you know, the way the world has changed since you were during that period of time. What got you through it? What was the thing that you called on 
to help you along the way? Yeah, I mean, so luckily I had a really amazing supportive family. Um, and I always had great friends. And so when you have um, that love and that support, when you have access, um, you know, to people who you feel like understand you and celebrate you and love you, um, you can kind of get through anything, you know? That ability to understand people, I'm sure that's a value that's clearly been instilled by your family or your parents or somewhere along the way. How have you translated that into your daily practice as the CEO of Barry's? Yeah, that's interesting because I, I um, when I look at the values of Barry's, they are very, like, each and every one of them is a quality or characteristic that would definitely like describe my parents and the way that I was raised. Right. Um, so there are a lot of similar similarities there. You know, one of the things that I had looked at was with this family community mantra. And I would imagine that's something that you're carrying the torch for Barry, because that's something I'm sure that was a value to him. Based on your conversations and based on who the company is and what you represent, how was that the value that was decided on? Because it sounds to me like that's something you've always rallied around. Um, you know, I think when I came into the equation, uh, Barry's was, it, it, was am, it was amazing, but it was very different. It was uh, much more um, military sort of like, uh, borderline humiliation. Like if people weren't running at certain speeds, they were in trouble and they were thrown out of the class. And it just, it was actually a very different culture. Um, and through the years, um, you know, I'd like to think that I had something to do with that. It went from being a place where people were scared of, and then many times came and never came back. Always worked, right? The efficacy and the product and you know, how it could change someone's body and mind always worked, but um, the culture associated and the, ex the client experience associated with it definitely changed dramatically. How do you do it? Because I'll be frank, fear was a tactic that I swear I employed for 10 years because it was the only thing I knew as a really young lawyer because I looked like I was about 11 and had no business being there. So as a consequence, it's how I insulated and protected myself it's the completely inappropriate way to manage a staff, grow a business and do those things. You went from a militaristic principle to a family community oriented value system. How did you make such a significant transition while being able to sell to the owner and the powers that be that this newfound mantra was the one and the one that was going to work? Um, I mean, it just was, it was, it crossed so many years um, and it had a lot to do, I think, with um, the people that I was hiring, sharing in that, you know, sharing in those values and having that sort of like shared vision of what everyone wanted the organization to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to remember too, you know, like I was moving, I moved to San Diego and I hired and trained all of those people. And I moved to New York and I hired and trained all those people. And, um, you know, I wrote the, the franchise manuals. And so um, it was many, many years of um, working hard and having an impact on people. And I would, I would also say that like Barry went through a huge change from, you know, 1998 to 2008. You know, he, he was a completely different person 10 years later. And he has his own set of, you know, experience, life experiences and um, is actually like the sweetest man on earth. <laughs> um, and to an extent, like the way he used to teach, I think was less like who he is as a person than the way he taught in the end, if that makes sense. It was kind of like an act and, you know, Barry is actually like the sweetest person on earth. So there wasn't much convincing 
um, that had to be done. There was just like a different approach, I think, to the business. You know, you were able to, you know, confect this team that you try and train and then they're training and it's the pyramid trickle down effect. Obviously you've taught them what to look for in the personnel that they hire. What did you look for in them when you were looking for people to fulfill these roles to grow the company? I was looking for the same stuff. It just wasn't, you know, defined and articulated on a piece of paper, but I was looking for people um, who weren't afraid of hard work because, you know, what we do at Barry's is, you know, long hours and early, you know, early mornings and you start at 5 a.m. And actually when I worked, the labor laws were very different. So <laughs> that was just like a different time. Um, but in the end, like we're really all there, we're supposed to be having fun, you know? And so one of the things I'd always look for in an interview is like, does this person have a good sense of humor? Um, are people going to enjoy working with this person? Do they take themselves too seriously? Um, and so I would say it was just, you know, uh, it was always the same kind of qualities. It just hadn't been defined as our values, our formal values. That's challenging, I mean, to say the very least, because it's so hard with, you know, people come for an interview and it's 10 minutes to basically understand who they are at their core. It's interesting you looked at those things because most people don't attribute those qualities to a certain extent with hard work and seriousness and the ability to get the job done. What did you trust within yourself to make the right decisions? Um, I mean, I've always been a pretty good judge of character, uh, but I also, by the way, made plenty of mistakes. You know, there were a lot of people I hired that weren't right for the job. Um, I'd say particularly when I transitioned from entrepreneur to CEO, um, there was a learning curve there for me because I was hiring a different person, right? I was hiring like C-level executives and, um, I th think that as it relates to people, um, you kind of have to trust your gut. Um, and I, I got a little bit distracted when I started hiring, like as a CEO, I was getting so hung up on experience, resume, um, you know, education. And that's really where I stumbled. Uh, and then once I brought back to it, the like, the gut piece and the like, do I want to hang out with this person? Like, do I think they're going to be, you know, a positive experience for the people that work for them? Um, are they, you know, one thing we're big on at Barry's is something called servant leadership. <clears throat> and, you know, I think there were a couple of hires I missed that just were not advocates of servant leader leadership. Um, so you learn through your mistakes, you know, and you do the best you can to, to trust your, your HR team, right? And the people that are supposed to be recruiting um, to really deliver to you people that have the capabilities. And then by the time I sit down with them, I really, um, I'm looking for more than that. You know, I'm looking for who they are as people and um, what I think they might bring to the organization and, and how I think they're gonna treat people that report into them. <clears throat> Last question before I have to turn it over to the viewers. You alluded to making some mistakes hiring with respect to your overall business decision making what do you think was the worst decision you made and how did you grow from it as a CEO oh man the worst decision I made. legally talk about it Joey <laughs> what was that? instead of you're allowed to legally talk about it <laughs> <laughs> um or just one that you think you really grew from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know. Nothing comes to mind. I mean, I've made so many mistakes and there are so many lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, I guess maybe there was just one higher, you know, which I think I already kind of described, but there was this one person that seemed, um, 
so overqualified and just so impressive on a piece of paper. Um, and I just underestimated, you know, the importance of what that actually, what that person actually felt like in a room. Mm -hmm. um, because if I could rewind to the original like interview where I sat down with the person, I definitely would not have hired them today. Um, and so I think that that's probably like the easiest one for me to come up with okay. without thinking about it too long. Sure. I've been doing this for 15 years, so there are plenty of mistakes I could pick from. Let's turn it over to some viewers' questions. Celia, I'm gonna get you to read those to Joey. <laughs> Joey, our first question is from Tanner. Did you have CEO in mind when you began working as an instructor? No. No. <laughs> I'm going um, to rub this thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's actually like a very common question. I never had CEO in mind. Um, and even up until, because I was, um, the COO at the time of the transaction when North Castle, you know, bought into the business and um, they did interviews, I think, basically trying to figure out who they wanted to run the business. And in my interview, I said something along the lines of, you know, I just want to be really candid with you. Like, it's not about the bottom line for me, which is like, who says that to private equity if they want to be the CEO? <laughs> um, I just wanted to always keep growing the business. Um, and, you know, transforming lives. And I had a very authentic connection to this company and this brand. Um, but I definitely never felt like I was like ladder climbing. And so a lot of times when people ask like, how do I get to be a CEO or how do I get, I'm just like the wrong person to ask. <laughs> um, because for me, it, there was no strategy involved. It was really just following my heart. Our next question is from Kid Vicious. Mentioning meditation was eye-opening. Any tips, tricks, or tools of the trade that have helped you in this practice? Um, tips like in terms of meditation? Yeah, you should definitely, I think for beginners especially, that guided meditation is the best. Um, we bought an app called Calm for all of our employees. Um, and actually gave it to, to all our employees at the time that we had to let a lot of them go just to help them get through, you know, these few months. Um, and Calm is just one of many, of many apps that are out there, but I think the guided meditations um, are just an easier way to dive into the practice. So I would suggest, you know, one of them. There, there are, there's Headspace, there's Calm, there's so many of them. Do some research and, and see works for you. Our next question is from Lizzie Daniel. What has been one of your biggest challenges or missteps that you turned around into opportunity in life or at Barry? Uh, biggest missteps in life or at Barry's that I turned into an opportunity. I mean, I guess it's uh I, so I grew up an actor and, you know, I was working throughout high school um, and moved to California to go to USC and continue to study both acting and, you know, film and television. And then I graduated. And since I had already had a pretty long career in it, um, I was really disenchanted with what it felt like in Los Angeles as compared to what it was like in Chicago. And, you know, I, at the time, had like a couple different jobs. Uh, I had given up on acting and I stumbled across Barry's. And that was actually the biggest transition of my life was um, just recognizing uh, that this was this thing. I think a lot of people would have just kept going to Barry's and then staying in their jobs. Um, and you know, at the time I was like a temp in an office and they offered me a full-time position there. And um, instead of saying yes and just continuing to work out at Barry's where I found my joy, uh, I took a very big risk and I took the chance to like become a part-time instructor, not take the full-time job, make very little money for a long period of time um, and, you know, devote my life uh, to, to something that I was 
passionate about passionate about that did not translate into dollar signs for for a long long time <clears throat> she said thank you and what does your typical day look like balancing so much from diet to workout to family <laughs> uh typical day so it always starts with my meditation uh, and then immediately making breakfast for my kids which is always one waffle, a side of yogurt, sometimes fruit if I'm lucky and they, if they eat it and an egg each. Um, <laughs> and then from there, uh, the day varies. I, I work out almost every day, at least you know five or six times a week. Um, in terms of my work life, it's typically a lot of meetings. Uh, nowadays, a lot of Zoom calls. Um, and then I always end up, you know, making dinner again at night and sitting down with my family and enjoying that time. And then before bed, uh, usually reading or sometimes watching TV, one of the two. And our last question comes from Amanda. What is the footprint you want to leave us with in your legacy? What is the footprint I want to leave? What was that? As your legacy. As your legacy. Oh, um, I think, you know, for me, it's never been in terms of footprint. I've never wanted Barry's to be the biggest. We only have 70 studios, which seems like a lot, but there are much bigger players out there than us. Um, but I have always wanted it to be the best. Um, and that's really hard. That's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. Um, so I think in, in thinking through what that means to be the best. Um, I think to me, what it means is fostering a culture and an environment where your community and your employees feel, you know, celebrated um, and have a sense of belonging. Um, so that's what I want to leave behind as my legacy. And our youngest viewer, Lola, she says, hi, how long do you meditate? Hi. And how old are your kids? Uh, I meditate for, uh, it's usually like around 12 to 15 minutes a day. And then my kids are three and four. That was my daughter. She is. I thought so. <laughs> she is tuned in and fully, fully committed. I can tell you that. Um, the one thing I did want to mention is if you don't mind telling us very quickly about the United We Sprint Challenge that Barry's has on and committed to? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so every year um, we do different frequency challenges at Barry's, which just basically invites our clients to take X amount of classes uh, during a certain amount of time. Um, and every year we do United We Sprint. It typically benefits an LGBTQ uh, community. Um, this year, instead, uh, we are donating to uh, NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, uh, as well as the Watts Empowerment Center. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really the last two to three weeks has really heavily impacted Barry's internally. Um, and we have, you know, hired a VP of Diversity and Inclusion in the process of hiring a director of uh, Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. Uh, and have made, you know, a lifelong commitment to creating an environment that is actively anti-racist. So this, this is just one of the um, first ways that our customers will see it from a marketing standpoint. So it's going to be a great challenge. You take 10, uh, either 10 or 20 classes during 30 days, and you can take those classes either in a studio where you live or online at Barry's at home. Uh, and you get a different prize for when you finish the 10 classes or when you finish the 20 classes, so. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a great commitment. I mean, the Vice President of Diversity, I think is such an interesting foray into how to do the right thing in the community. I really commend you guys. Thank you, appreciate um, it. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's always good to hear somebody in a position of leadership's advice and I think what you've created at Barry's is something that we all strive for because family and community and particularly a sense of belonging is, is such a lost value. And um, 
it's been very educational for me. I know it's been very educational for everybody. I'm going to steal some of your ideas. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank um, you both. I appreciate really it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Uh, from Patrick and Randy here at Patrick Daniel Law, that was The Legal Lens with Joey Gonzalez. Thank you again for everything. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.